good thing. Actually, this one doesn't have dead ends, so it is different in uh, that it sense. Is, it is different in that in that way. So there's a whole set of things with regards to streamlining, uh, putting um, you know uh, uh, limits on time frame for procedures, uh, making clear what the criteria are, and removing overlapping jurisdictions that are really important. Uh, to lower the cost of, of right of way access, and that improves the ability for operators to get access to make better business cases for deployment and investment. I would also say one other thing on the data part. Uh, my experience when I was at NASA is that the NASA is an interesting agency because we take data, in some cases, science data, very uh, seriously, and we make that available to scientists. It's an engineered product. Um, the business operations of the federal agencies have never been thought of as some, something that is kind of a main point and not a side point. And if you have difficulty in getting uh, good reporting data at your level, um, what are, how, how opaque is that data inside the agency itself? Because if you don't have transparency inside the agency, how can people propose to improve processes? You know, inside Google, we, uh, do a lot in terms of making our business metri metrics uh, widely accessed inside of the company so that we can get suggestions about how to improve those processes. Uh, if those if data sets, uh, business processes, where expenses are, are being uh, uh, allocated, et cetera, are not transparent inside an agency, how can that agency make its own process better? You as a business owner, so certainly, how would you like it be able to make decisions on where to invest, where to distribute, if you couldn't get, if people inside your company didn't have good access to the GL and know where people were stiffing you, where sales were going. The government doesn't think of these processes in a strategic way. And that's the real problem, in my opinion. I said it was the last comment, but I will follow up one for the record. My, uh, my old company sold Circuit City and Best Buy and, and Walmart too, but the difference between Circuit City and Best Buy, and now that Circuit City's gone, it's pretty easy to tell <laughs> the story. At Circuit City, it was against the rules to show actually the vendor what the inventory on hand was. We would get our, 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 our orders and they would be added, subtracted, and held and, and expedited. But you'd have to go into Richmond and you'd have to say, you know, can you, can you kind of show me it on a piece, on a printout, a paper printout? And they would kind of show you where the inventories were by warehouse and region, and you'd write it down feverishly. And sometimes they give you a little more information, but that was about it. At Best Buy, and for that matter, Walmart, I could tell, or people working for me daily could tell right. at any time how many units were in each store, how many were in the warehouses, where they were in the shipping process, and you know, literally we could figure out whether one store was selling and the store next to it wasn't selling. We could deploy people in to find out why they weren't selling. Perhaps they were sitting in the warehouse and never been put out on the shelves. Best Buy's here today, Circuit City's gone. Mr. Chaffetz. Just to follow up on what Chairman Ice was saying, I, I concur. We have this, uh, this challenge government-wide because I think there are a lot of agencies that don't want to be held accountable. They don't want somebody looking over their shoulder. They won't provide the very basic data. You would think you could go to, to uh, certain agencies and just be able to extract data. You go to USAID and ask them, tell me the projects where we spent these billions of dollars. They can't even give you a, an Excel spreadsheet to, to even show you what, what, what projects they're even working on. Um, and then you compound that and you look at, for instance, at the patent office and the lack of data and information that they have there. And it's, it's stunning because this is what becomes a competitive advantage for the United States of America. Let me go a little bit further, because I, 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 I just, I need to understand the, um, the limitations on the technology itself, because it, it strikes me that Google's going to great lengths to try to work on broadband and even lay fiber and whatnot, but what are the limitations on wireless and satellite and those types of communication? Why, why so much effort on actually laying actual cable as opposed sure. to expanding it. I mean, wireless is, what are the limitations there? Sure. Um, it's important to recognize that the wireless networks uh, provide connectivity to an underlying infrastructure that connects, mm -hmm. that trunks all these systems together. Today, uh, fiber can carry enormous amounts of data, far more than wireless can. So basically, wireless is an extension of the fiber footprint. 
And so you think about it as an integrated system. In some cases, um, you know, it's a cost-benefit ratio. If I can get spectrum at a low enough price of a wide enough amount, I can oper generate an access capacity of, say, 20 megabits or 40 megabits, et cetera. Uh, but the fiber itself can carry terabits of data. So the issue is, fundamentally, uh, how, how, how close do you, can you get to the fiber? Because the fiber is the thing that, that but drives what, it. What are the limits in the bandwidth? And, and the, I mean, do you see us bumping up against these, uh, what, what has been allocated out in the public? Well, the, this is a long, complex uh, story. <laughs> uh, you know, in the U.S., uh, there's government spectrum and there's commercial spectrum. Two different agencies regulate these. Uh, they have very different policies. Uh, Spectrum has been allocated in a number of ways um, uh, by user, by type of use. So you have PMRS versus CMRS. No, I guess I'm trying context. to get to the bottom line is, are we not allocating enough spectrum space, I guess is part of my yes. question. I think, I, think, I think in general, sorry, simple answer is yes, more commercial spectrum needs to be out there, more unlicensed spectrum needs to be out there. There is a ton of spectrum that is assigned, but not in use. Can you quantify that? Can you quantify? We have this. I, I, I'm looking I for think, some numbers sure. and ratios and percentages sure. to I help think, me understand. I think total amount of commercial allocated spectrum is ballpark is something in the order of 270 megahertz has been allocated for commercial mobile radio service. Um, if you compare that to the amount of spectrum allocated for, um, for broadcast, TV, which is, I know, a, mm -hmm. a current uh, discussion, it's about the same, right? That is to say, uh, the total amount of broadcast spectrum is about the same amount that we have allocated to, to uh, CMRS. Uh, and so there's large pockets of this. Government is the probably the largest uh, sector in terms of the total amount of spectrum it holds in its inventory. Now, a lot of that is important, right? You have radars, you have air-to-ground communications, you have... Uh, military requirements. So it's not to say that, well, you do, you can reclaim the spectrum that's in use of this radar, right? Um, but I think if you look at the nature of the spectrum allocation process, um, we have speculators, we have people who hold spectrum but don't build on it. Uh, we have all of this spectrum is tied up in ways that doesn't allow it to be used by carriers and uh, consumers. So, so you, do you see us now at the current usage rates across the Amer uh, across the, the country that we're bumping up against these ceilings? Are you, ex are you advocating that we expand those ceilings and look at reallocating the different uh, channels by which we use this? Uh, I believe that if you look at the time frame it takes for the government to take action on spectrum, it's usually on the order of a decade or so, right? Um, so if if I basically, if you're going to force me to say we can't make decisions on spectrum sooner, quicker than a decade, which goes back to the earlier point I made, then yeah, we bet, then we're in a, at a big problem, right? Because uh, so you think we're running out of spectrum in the next ten years? Is that? Uh, I think I think if you look at growth rates and data, uh, we need more spectrum. We need the ability to uh, to build uh, more base stations easily because spectrum is not. Spe you can actually get more capacity out of spectrum by taking the spectrum that's used by one base station and actually cre uh, splitting that into several base stations. Also, the issue about offloading spectrum through fem offloading wireless traffic through femto cells and unlicensed communications. Today, right, if you look at how much data is offloaded on Wi-Fi from the commercial networks, right, are the costs that consumers would, would have to uh, bear by by having all of that traffic be carried on commercial uh, license spectrum, we, 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 it, it would just not be in a, in a reasonable way. So it turns out it's a combination of things that, that you need. Uh, there's no silver bullet, right? And one of the challenges is how do you look at how spectrum is used? What requirements, you know, spectrum is chopped up into different use rules. I can use broadcast spectrum for one thing, I can use commercial mobile spectrum for another set of uses. Private spectrum, PMRS, is, it cannot be used for, for mobile. So there's all these rules that apply to different kinds of spectrum that prevents it from being used from one purpose right. for another. Thank you. Thank you. Do either of you others want to comment on that? 
Okay. Uh, I'll just briefly say we've been doing a lot of work around white spaces yeah. and other things, and uh, we'd be happy to follow up with you and staff on on some kind of innovative things. I'm an, I'm an optimist and believe that our technologies will advance fairly rapidly. But uh, one of the points that I would say is is hardline and wireless both matter. That's not an answer of one or the other. Um, I am very confident that indeed we will be bumping up against capacity issues. We currently are and will continue to be because our desire for data and information is continuing to grow. Moore's law, Metcalf's law is still happening. So I think I would answer your question that way, that we need to continue to be very, very aggressive about capacity issues and our ability to move information. Our future competitiveness depends upon it. Um, and then maybe if each of you could just very quickly uh, let's touch, touch on uh, cloud computing, because obviously the private sector is still starting to come to grips with the, what this means, and, and the federal government is trying to come to grips with what it means. We, the, the federal government seems to operate in, in silos. Everybody has to have their own network, their own security, their own. And I think there's a great reluctance, kind of a human nature reluctance to want to, to move towards the cloud. And can you touch on the positives and negatives of what the, what the, the challenges that you see, um, not only for the government, but for the private sector. And we'll just go swiftly down, down the road. Maybe we can start with you, Mr. McKee. Sure. So, I mean, I'll, I'll harken back to, I think, some of the chairman's opening statements. And, and he didn't use the word shiny object, but I think we do a, a big job in the computing industry of developing new technologies and often, often framing them. I'm very pragmatic. Cloud computing isn't something that happened and fell from the sky recently. It's been much more of an evolution than a revolution. Uh, in fact, cloud computing, I would, uh, I would just frame as network-enabled services. What has changed is the, the depth of our networks and the quality of the software and the reliability that's allowed us to continue to spread out and move the edge farther and farther out. I think that will continue to happen, and, and we'll ur we urge Congress, and there's a lot of data in my written testimony, about specific policies and issues we think Congress should continue to look at to accelerate and uh, adoption of cloud computing technologies. Uh, I would agree with, uh, with that. I would also say that if you look at uh, the, the market, entrepreneurs are some of the, oh, sorry. Uh, entrepreneurs are some of the uh, early adopters of cloud computing technology because it allows them to scale re really rapidly and without a large-scale investment initially. So if you look at here in the Valley, how many startups are using cloud computing as their platform simply because their business model would not work without it? And I think one of the interesting questions is, are there opportunities where the traditional model in the government for solving uh, data processing elements, uh, you wouldn't even bother trying to do it in the old way, but would be empowered with this new way that allows government to move faster, quicker with more transparency because the cloud also has the at least the ability to break down some of these silos in, in ways that uh, these uh, uh, vertically integrated platforms do not. So as an entrepreneur that uh, does uh, gain great benefit from the cloud, we, um, we are a SaaS uh, model that allows um, our 1,250 clients to keep their pre-release earnings information on a very secure network. So we live, eat, and breathe this every day. And I feel that um, um, certainly the, the government should explore the opportunity and benefits that come from cloud computing. Um, these gentlemen are in the world to provide the service that we use, for which I thank you very much. Um, what we believe, though, is cloud computing is important. So is the information that resides on that cloud computing. And we will constantly push to ensure that data is accessible um, to each and all, and, and one of the things that we live by is that we believe that data um, is, is, needs to be democratic to all users, um, and especially that is why we want to continue to push the SEC um, to ensure that all public filings, not just Qs and Ks, um, are available in an XBRL format so that um, um, all investors have the ability to access that information. Very good, thank you. Well, one last thing I have, Chairman, and then uh, be done with my questions. Maybe we can go back in the reverse order here. Uh, it, all of this comes back uh, in one of the integrated uh, questions here is obviously cybersecurity. And I don't know if you're able to quantify this, but you know, one of the challenges we have in the federal government, everybody operating all these different silos, there then tends to be all these different uh, operating entities, and every time you, you go to you know, hear about an appropriation, there's massive money for cybersecurity. Nobody quite knows exactly what that means. 
We also look at which agencies should be in, in, engaged and involved in the enforcement and the, uh, the international nature of cybersecurity and how we fight back against that. I don't have any comments or any uh, uh, perspective on how bad and how difficult this situation is because the access to that data, surreptitious <laughs> access to this data is obviously a massive issue for the federal government. Um, it is a very real threat. Um, it is something that as we look at the future of conflict in the world, traditionally it has been armies marching across fields and there will be battles over, I think, water and over cybersecurity in the, in, in the future that make that will be new when you look at past history. Um, you know, as a company, it is incredibly important to us because of the information that we maintain. Um, and so I'm gonna leave my comment at that because I don't wanna raise any flags. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, one of the challenges uh, is if the agency's business processes have really not been thought of in a strategic way, it is very complicated to retrofit security in these kind of models. And security is really best thought of as when you're building a system, right? And the problem is the, our, the, the value of that information to enemies of the United States has gone up over time, but the architecture of the system may not have recognized that. And I think that's a real challenge because it goes back to uh, it's not about, well, spend X dollars on this project and it will fix your problem, right? It's really about thinking about information in a strategic way, thinking about systems in a strategic way. And as long as an agency does not think about it that way, you're going to have vulnerabilities. The same way, in fact, some of this, if you can't get reporting data out of a system, one of the interesting questions is, um, does that mean that the, that the access to that information is so esoteric, right, that nobody can protect it effectively either, or can you say it's protected? I mean, these are really interesting challenges when you architect IT systems that I think need to be thought of. Um, I'll just say bri briefly that um, you're, you're absolutely right in today's world that the reality is um, with the growth of networks and information that the attack vectors um, have increased significantly and they're a whole new level. I would encourage you uh, uh, in Congress to continue to look at ways uh, to encourage public-private partnerships and the ways for different entities to work together to share information. Um, the government security program is a great example. Um, there's a really great example out of New York, a gentleman named Will Pelgren did the multi-state ISAC where they were uh, sharing computer incident and response. Um, part of the challenge with cyber security is our ability to respond quickly uh, and when we see issues happening. Um, and being able to share information. So I would encourage Congress, and there's uh, quite a bit of detail in my written testimony, and we'd be happy to follow up with additional uh, information on how we can uh, ensure that we s secure these absolutely critical assets. Thank you, you back. Thank you, I'm gonna do one quick follow-up. As a member of Energy and Commerce on leave, I, uh, I can't help but, but, and I know you'll follow up for the record, but are you proposing, obviously freeing up bandwidth, but one thing that, that I've always been worried about is that if we give more bandwidth, let me rephrase that, if we sell more bandwidth as we so often do, what we essentially do is we, we get hooked on it as a revenue source and we lose track of, of first of all, the real goal is, is, is the public uh, good. It's not the temporary return on, on some asset that is only intangibly uh, belonging to the federal government. But the whole idea of going to micro cell uh, technology, the, uh, and just quickly, you all know that uh, most of the major carriers all have micro cells that basically exist so that you can take your, uh, your internet wired backbone, and when you're in a place that doesn't have a cell and you're dissatisfied, you can have your, your den have one of these units. And they're in their infancy, and they're, they're, they're the most crippled product I've ever seen. They, uh, they make them so they don't work for your whole house or even for your whole den if you have a 24 by 24 den. And yet it would seem like this is ultimately one of the things that we probably ought to have is, if you will, a universal microcell type concept that is small, can be smaller if 
you come into Signal so that it, it, it in fact is a smart microcell, but that in fact if I go out to Wyoming uh, and there's a signal, or I go out to Wyoming and there isn't a signal, why wouldn't I want to take this already allocated bandwidth that exists for the purpose of cellular data and, uh, 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 and voice and get it onto the land as soon as possible, if you will, isn't it a public service if we make sure that the FCC promotes these products so that consumers get off of everyone else's airwaves, even though it's leased airwaves, as soon as possible. And if you take that kind of concept and you spread it throughout a lot of technology, wouldn't, wouldn't we very quickly make the same amount of bandwidth go further? Mr. Uh, Medine. Yeah, you're, you're right. Physics, in fact, is on your side. Uh, if you look at many of the analysis, they say uh, data growth will go up by a factor of 30, right? Well, no one is proposing that spectrum can grow by a factor of 30. So you have to do this kind of cellularization, taking cells and offloading traffic, uh, you know, at, in smaller and finer areas. That's the only way to grow the total capacity of the system. So you're exactly right about femtocells and, and these microcell uh, devices. That, by the way, is another reason why unlicensed is really important. One of the things that Google as a company is very concerned about is in this move to um, reallocate spectrum, it's being propelled almost with a, a giddiness about revenue that makes policy uh, a second uh, fiddle, uh, which the law is actually says, the statutes actually say, you're not allowed to use revenue considerations in how you set spectrum policy. But yet- If Congress would just obey its own law. Well, there is that. Uh, but I think that's part of the issue. If you look at what Wi-Fi has done in terms of offloading traffic, your, I, your, your smartphone, when you go into your house, it's now using the Wi-Fi network for its data and not the cellular system. If that wasn't there, the kind of innovation that we would see in terms of smartphones and the Internet and access would really be dwarfed. Uh, and so you have to, the physics drives you. You cannot solve this problem just by allocating more spectrum. It is fundamentally about creating uh, uh, smaller and smaller pockets of wireless, and unlicensed is a huge driver of that. So I think that's exactly right. And that I just want to say, uh, optimizing for revenue is not optimizing for public interest benefit to consumers, and uh, that's a big challenge in the way the spectrum process is run today. Thank you. Uh, you know, we came here really as part of the committee's uh, activities on. Uh, uh, AmericanJobCreators.com. We're going to have uh, staff has a couple of questions, I believe, for you. But you've been helpful here today. Very clearly, we're looking for places in which government is in the way of the American job creator getting the job done. And you've given us some wonderful starting points. Uh, one of the challenges is that uh, Jason and I are going to have to take this back, uh, report it to the members who sit on a lot of other committees. Because as you can imagine, a lot of what needs to be done needs to be done by ENC, the tax committees, and so on, uh, and particularly the comments on, on H-1B and where we need to go on, on, on real uh, technology innovators and making sure we gather as many as we can. And with that, Hudson, do you have some questions? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, go, ahead, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hudson Hollister, counsel to the majority staff, uh, where I've worked on uh, data XBRL is my job. Uh, I've, I've got a couple of follow-up questions uh, just for the record about data transparency. And Mr. Quinlan, you pointed out in your testimony that the SEC's XBRL mandate is for now the best example we have of imposing data structure on a really complex and diverse set of financial data, in this case, corporate financial statements uh, in U.S. GAAP. Uh, what has the SEC's XBRL mandate done for the quality of the market's analysis of corporate financial statements so far? And if the mandate matures, what can we expect it'll do for the quality of the market's analysis of financial statements in the future? Great. So we, um, we break the XBRL mandate into essentially two macro segments, uh, creation and consumption. On the creation side, it is taking all of the information provided in Qs and Ks today and turning that into an open standard or XBRL data. 
Um, that is the 1,250 clients that we have today. That's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're creating that information. Um, the mandate has been out now for about 18 months. You have about one third of all publicly traded companies providing information. Um, just recently, we were getting into the actual notes um, rather than just the front facing financials. So the data is extremely new. Um, the amount of data available is going to increase about fivefold from now to Q3 of this year. Um, when that happens, as you get two things, much more data and then much mature data from the initial Fortune 500 com companies, we expect the consumption side of the business, now that the creation side of the business has had an opportunity to mature, the consumption side, um, we believe, will take off dramatically. There have been um, some of the largest data gathering companies in the world have been reaching out to Rivet recently to understand how to take this metadata and start to incorporate it directly into their systems. So there is an increased inertia. And, and, and when I say increased inertia, maybe we got one phone call a quarter, three quarters ago. Now we're getting many a week. So the, this, I believe within the next 12 months, the consumption business will go through a dramatic revolution in how people consume this data. It is just at the forefront today. There's a bit of a philosophical difference about how the government should collect financial information and how the government should seek to prevent a future financial crisis. Um, what impact uh, on the market's ability to avoid a future financial crisis uh, do you think broad-based collection of standardized financial data might have if it were mandated? Um, so there was a, a, a fairly well-read book out right now called um, The Big Short. And in The Big Short, there was a story um, about a, and I apologize that I can't remember his name, um, a trader based here in Silicon Valley, actually, who took the, who did the ridiculous thing of sitting down and reading the prospectuses of these CDOs. And literally, these things had been written. You know, this information had been created, and these things had been written by people. But nobody ever actually sat down and read it. And so what this individual did is he sat down and he read it and he realized when he read it that there was really not a, these, that these CDOs were junk. And the information, by the way, was available to everybody. It was just this one individual that sat down and read these pages upon pages on pages of endless information to realize what was inside these. What we believe is if you take what one exceptional human being did and provide that information in a way where one doesn't need to be quite that exceptional or patient to sit down and read these endless prospectuses, that that information will make, it will never eliminate the ability of human beings to destroy a good system, <laughs> but it will certainly make it at least more visible um, and therefore less likely that the damage is as widespread. So if you were able to go in and tag everything inside a CDO with metadata, to show exactly what types of mortgages, if you could, within a click of a button, open up um, a CDO and see exactly the credit scores of every individual inside that when it's parsed up in many different forms and fashions, I think that the pricing of that would be much more accurate to its future marketability rather than hope. So hope is not a good strategy, and, and I think that transparency takes hope out of the equation. Uh, thanks, and one other question for the whole panel. Well, we've talked a little bit about the uh, impact for the quality of analysis on data structure for financial statements. Can we extrapolate that to what might happen if Congress were to mandate data structure for federal spending? Absolutely. Um, to, and I want to again agree that data is, more data is not just the solution. It's data in a way that people can actually use it. You know, if we think back to the 80s, I, re I remember um, there was that, wasn't it, $800 toilet seat or an $800 wrench, or there was some big, you know, where yeah, I believe it was a coffee pot. Was it a coffee pot? I apologize. <laughs> but there also was a wrench. It, right. Uh, yes, it's uh, and, and government so, accounting at work. Right. And so when you, when that information, when that information starts to come out, it creates embarrassments, and embarrassments create people to, and I don't think that nobody was intentionally buying an $800 wrench. I think people just weren't paying attention to the invoice because, again, they didn't have the information until after the fact. So I think that if we can, at the federal level, create a standard that allows that information to be accessible so that decision makers, before they make the decision, understand what they're deciding, I think, by and large, the nature of those in federal government is to do the best that they can 
but here comes the important part with the information that they have. And so I think we need to provide them the information prior to making decisions. Um, I was actually informed today of a, of a uh, process in the federal government where there is a performance indicator that is required um, by Congress eight months before um, cabinets actually put together their budget, but the results aren't released until eight months after the budget cycle for that previous year is complete. So again, it's not that the performance metrics are a bad idea, but getting the, getting the report card after you've already thrown your birthday party <laughs> based on what your grades were <laughs> is not a good idea. <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quinn. Thank you, Chairman Issa, for this uh, unique courtesy. Really appreciate it. My name is Brian Quinn. I'm counsel to the Democratic staff of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Unfortunately, our Democratic members uh, of the committee could not make it today. Uh, but on behalf of those members, I'd like to thank the witnesses for appearing and thank Chairman Issa for holding this important field hearing. We believe this is a very important issue and look forward to a continuing dialogue with the high tech industry on how federal policies and regulations can support job growth and global competitiveness. We are also interested in seeing how emerging technologies can enhance the transparency and accountability of the federal government. Uh, I have no questions at this time, but again, thank you for this courtesy and for appearing today at this field hearing. Thank you. Uh, and, and as we close, I, I will tell the story since uh, uh, Senator Boxer was one of the people who, uh, who was very big on the, uh, the coffee pot, the wrench, the mug, and so on. The interesting thing is that it was government accounting in some cases, because if you only want 10 coffee pots for 10 aircraft, and you want it designed to work on that aircraft, and you want it to meet FAA requirements, and you certainly don't want it to explode in decompression, uh, it could cost a few non-recurring costs. And when you burden the non-recurring cost into 10 devices, even if the device was free, you now have $1,000 worth of burden uh, and it's one of the challenges that, uh, Mr. McKee, I thought I really appreciated your, your response. We need to have a level of transparency so that we can determine whether something is a reasonable value based on the, the nature of the beast. If every product that the government bought or didn't buy, and particularly when we look at a COTS product versus uh, the development of our own products, if we really looked at what the true cost was, we would obviously get to a very different uh, uh, analysis time and time again. So I want to thank all of you for helping not only talk to us about where impediments to job creation lie, but also some of the necessary reforms in the government uh, that will prevent the next global meltdown by simply having those imperfections, unreported imperfections in the market, be well reported and well understood well before uh, somebody who shorted the market is proven right. So with that, I want to thank you for your participation. The record will remain open so that if you have thoughts and you want to revise or extend and some of the items that you said you provide for the record would be made available. And we'll, in this case, we'll make it two weeks since we're on district work period and that will work very well with uh, the end of these, uh, these hearings. Thank you, we stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>